people, and welcome back to Green Wing Gaming, or welcome if you're new. If this is your first time on the channel, this here is a Friday upload, and Fridays on this channel, we like to play tabletop games. So today we are continuing our playthrough of Rangers of Shadow Deep. We're continuing the Burning Light mission pack. Now, if this is somehow the first video on the channel that you're clicking on, you're kind of late in the game. This should be episode 14 in our Rangers of Shadow Deep playthrough. I would at the very least recommend going back to episode 11, I believe. No, episode 12. Sorry, episode 12. Uh, because that's when we started the Burning Light mission pack. So uh, you're more than welcome to keep watching this, but you're, you're going to be a little at a loss for what's going on because I, I'm not going to punish the, the longer term viewers by just completely re-explaining everything. Short version, our heroic band of companions have have ridden deep into the sh into the shadow deep that was an interesting combination of words uh, uh they have arrived at a destroyed convent that has been filled with horrible monsters that destroyed the place and they are seeking an ancient and powerful relic of healing to to assist in the war against these nefarious creatures that are looking to sweep over the world uh, let's see, in the last scenario, we, we last, last time we saw each other, we did scenario C, which was the courtyard, where we managed to stumble our way out of the gatehouse and fight some skeletons, rather than the zombies we were dealing with in the first scenario in the gatehouse, and apparently skeletons are, like, way easier than zombies, because, uh, Tywin and his little band of friends, they did way better in the last episode than the first one. Because they they just absolutely stomped those skeletons out and somehow ended the scenario with better health than when they began. Uh, I'm pretty sure the entire party is back to full health now. So, yeah, that was weird. Um, but something I should address before we go into the next scenario is that one of you commenters very politely pointed out that I had actually missed a particular rule for the Burning Light mission pack. There is a specific page in that mission pack that says that between each scenario, you are meant to add two more event cards from this, from a generic uh, shadow deep table that's like at the back of the mission pack. I forgot to do that for for, scenario, for the second scenario. So for this scenario that we're about to play, I added a, I added four new cards into the deck. So we're gonna have whatever missions were already in that scenario, or sorry, whatever cards were already in that scenario, plus four more from the generic table. Now, to, if that commenter who made that su suggestion is watching this, I'm not sure thank you is the, is the sentiment I want to express because I've looked at the generic table and, um, yeah, it's not good. It, it's not good for me. Um, this is almost certainly not going to end well, but we're going to give it a go anyway. So the missions are going to be getting progressively longer because as far as I can tell in each scenario, it's you keep playing until the deck runs out. And so the missions get, the scenarios get progressively longer and filled with harder and harder adversaries. So that's not great, <laughs> but oh well. Um, yeah, so for today's mission, for, sorry, today's scenario, I keep getting those two words mixed up. Uh, for today's scenario, we are moving on to scenario D, the library, because if I remember correctly, and I'm sure you guys will let me know if I don't, uh, in scenario C, we did find exactly one clue about where this relic we're looking for might be. Uh, and I believe it pointed us towards the, the library. So we're doing scenario D, the library. Because once, really, once you've made it to the courtyard, you can go wherever else you want in the mission. Um, yeah. So we, we ended up doing the gatehouse first, but you can technically just jump straight to the courtyard, it just didn't seem super thematic to me. Like, oh, let's let's start with the gatehouse. Now we're in the courtyard and we're moving on to the library. Uh, I have no idea what scenarios we'll do after that. I'm gonna try and hold off judgment on that until we've until we've played the uh, the mission and see if we find any other clues that might tell us where to go. Or hey, maybe we get super lucky and it turns out I'm right about the library and we just find the relic there. Who knows? We'll find out together. 
Uh, but with all that being said, before we jump into the scenario and just and just get playing, I would like to ask, take a quick second to remind you guys to consider liking this video, subscribing, watching as, as far into the video as you can possibly stand to hear me ramble is greatly appreciated. The extra view time really does help the channel a lot. Is uh, the, the number of viewed hours on this channel in a month is like one of the biggest things that helps me get towards monetizing. So right now the channel is completely non-monetized. I would like to change that because it would be kind of nice to maybe one day do this for a living. But other than that, I would just like to see, I would say that I would love to hear any comments, any thoughts in the comment section down below. Not even for engagement reasons, just because I genuinely like hearing from you guys. I say it in every video, I have never had a negative interaction with you guys in the comments. It's never happened. You guys are a pretty, are a pretty good bunch of dudes and dudettes. So uh, I, I look forward to hearing what you guys have to say. If you've been playing these scenarios, if you, if maybe hopefully this, uh, this uh, run through I'm doing has inspired you to play yourself, I would love to hear it. Uh, otherwise, just let me know how much you're, uh, how much you are or aren't enjoying the campaign. Uh, but with all that being said, I'm gonna quit uh, tooting my own horn, and we'll just get right into the game. We're playing Scenario D, the Library, so let's just get into it. All right. So before we get into the scenario, as usual, guys, I'm gonna give you the quick lore blurb for Scenario D, the Library. Opening the broken door to the tower, you see that nearly the entire floor of the chamber has collapsed and the basement below has flooded. Only one broken pathway is left to reach the stairs to the rooms above. Books and loose scraps of paper float on, on the water. There are, there are a couple of islands left, including one, of the, one in the far corner that contains an intact bookcase. Everything seems still and lifeless until something unseen causes the water to ripple. All right, so we've come into this library looking for the relic we've been sent to, to locate, and we find it looking quite a state, completely collapsed. Now, the the blurb there describes the the room as being flooded, and the I, I didn't have like a great way to symbolize that other than like putting just like a giant sheet of blue paper on the ground, which felt a little lame. So I'm not going to do that, but the way I've marked it out is anything, the way you, when you look at the map, the, the setup guide for the scenario specifically says that you should have a, a narrow two inch pathway along the player edge and the right edge connecting the entrance to the stairs leading up to the second floor. Now, over here, we have another room setup that's meant to symbolize the second floor, this little entryway here is going to symbolize where the stairs come up to the second floor from the bottom floor. Uh, over here in what is meant to symbolize the second floor, we have a couple other smaller rooms and a main room where we have a couple enemies. Crucially, it's not actually mentioned in the rules, but the way I'm gonna be playing this is that these uh, enemies here, these little blood bats is, is what they're meant to symbolize. I just ended up using the same uh, hormagons that I've been using as stand-ins for any baddies I don't have models for. Uh, they've become a bit of a staple of the campaign. The way I'm playing this is that they're just going to be staying by that table until one of my player models actually makes their way up the stairs and comes into the room. So until then, they're going to remain frozen in place. Over here, we have anything beyond these walls. I've used these little walls to mark out the pathway to the stairs. Anything to the left of those walls or forward from those walls is considered to be deep water, meaning it cuts a model's movement in half unless that model can fly. And if that model is in the water at the end of its movement, it has to take a swimming test. Now, so basically the only people I want moving through this water are like Gwyneth, maybe Archibald, or Thaddeus because he can fly and, and move past it. One thing I do want to note for you guys is that we have our little do doggo companion that we rescued in the last scenario. I've got him nice and painted up and ready to go. He's ready to be the goodest boy. Over here, we I what I have is a is a pair of alligators that I that I painted up. Uh, I just picked these up at my local comic book store. They're just generic D and D monsters. Uh, 
the, well, the game calls for them to be giant snakes. I figured alligators close enough. Why not? Uh, but then over here, in among some rubble and debris, we have a point of interest, a, a little uh, collection of somehow undamaged books, or less damaged books over here in the corner that someone will have to swim to if you want to find out what's in there. Over here we've got a stairway, and yeah, the one thing I do want to note for this scenario that I do owe you guys a bit of an apology for, the, the setup guide calls for these, these two rooms to be two feet wide and two feet long. Neither my table nor my game mat are actually big enough to accommodate that. I, I, and go figure, I didn't really feel like going out and buying a new table just to accommodate this scenario. So uh, in, this is only a three by three game mat. So what I did is I just shrunk both rooms down to, to 1.5 feet and 1.5 feet. So 18 inches by 18 inches. Uh, I understand that this could be seen as me making the scenario easier on myself, but it's just genuinely the best I could do. I do apologize if that ruins your experience, but running two simultaneous uh, maps, I understand why why the why Joseph McCullough did that. It's certainly a very cool concept, but it's just very difficult to pull off. So, anyways, with all that being said, and we've got our, our our board set up, and we're going to hop into the scenario just now for turn one. And here we are at the start of turn one. And we're going to start off in the ranger phase by group activating with Tywin here. Let me zoom in a little bit on him. Oop. Sorry for the blur there, guys. But there's Tywin leading from the front at the head of his, uh, of his merry band. And we're actually going to group activate with him the tracker Bryn and our swordsman Damien because they just seem like the natural points to to kick things off particularly because uh Tywin and Bryn both have ranged weapons and I want to try if I can to get some damage on these uh <laughs> giant snakes aka alligators as soon as we possibly can so we're going to start off with Tywin taking his first action to be making a throwing knife attack well Actually, before we even do that, let's make sure he's even in range. Throwing knives in this game have an 8-inch range. So, yes, Tywin is just within range of the nearest alligator. So he's going to be throwing his throwing knife at him. Now, uh, the reason Tywin has a throwing knife is just because the first one you take takes up no inventory slots. So why not? Uh, but with all that being said, let's go ahead and roll the first attack of this scenario. Oh! Well, hold on a second. Okay, so Tywin only has a shoot of plus one. Sorry for the blur there, guys. Uh, so he's only got a total of 19, and unfortunately our water snake has rolled a natural 20 with a fight of plus two. So unfortunately, that's not gonna, gonna be it. It's a good roll by Tywin, just the, the snake did a little bit better. Uh, from there, we're just gonna hop over to our tracker Bryn, our leather-clad hero with the musket, which, for those of you who are new to this game, this, this game doesn't actually have rules for a musket. We're just using the stats for a crossbow. So it just, basically just gets plus two damage, but it takes an action to reload. Just a quick reminder for how we've been doing that. Okay, so Bryn is going to do much the same and just dial up a musket shot at that nearby uh, crocodile. So, yeah, he's going to be shoot plus two to the crocodile's shoot fight plus two. So it's going to be dice even. Okay, it's a little bit better. It's a little bit better. Uh, so Bryn has rolled a 12 to the crocodile's three. The snake has an armor of eight so but then the crossbow gives him another plus two damage so that's gonna be a total of six damage taking this crocodile down to just four wounds remaining so here we go I'm just gonna put that over in there so that is Bryn's first action Damien's first action is gonna be pretty simple he has nothing to contribute he's wearing light armor and a shield so he's not going in that water because any swim checks he has to make are going to be at a massive penalty. So he's just going to come over here for his first action. Uh, then we do everyone's second action where Tywin is just going to kind of follow suit. Because again, he's got light armor 
and a shield, I'm not sending him in that water. That is not happening. And uh, Bryn, his second action is just going to be to reload. As per usual, he is basically just going to stay completely still and hope that the baddies <laughs> let, give him enough time to bust shots. Um, although, actually, do I want to move Tywin that far? I don't think I do because it is about to be the creature phase. So we're actually just going to have Tywin move up to the little gap in the stone there. Uh, and that's going to be his second action. Damien's second action is just going to be to move another three inches up the table. So he's just going to move up like so. He's basically just making a beeline for the stairs. He cannot help us at all with these, with this flooded basement of the library. So he's just going to go to where he can hopefully be useful. I say hopefully because, well, he hasn't been in the past. But that's really neither here nor there. Now, crucially, the, we move on to the creature phase, and these creatures, while they are listed as giant snakes, they are specifically mentioned as giant water snakes, which, which does change their stats ever so slightly in that it gives them the amphibious rule. So these snakes, or snake-like crocodiles, uh, are not do not have their movement in any way impeded by the water. They don't have to make swim checks, they don't have their movement reduced, nothing. So they're going to be able to move a lot faster in this water than they are. And unfortunately, they do have a movement of eight inches. So this snake is just going to come straight for Tywin. This right here is why I kept him there, because I knew that these baddies were going to be coming right at us. So the snake is going to make a beeline for, for Tywin, who I believe is a fight plus four against the snake's fight of plus three. Two. So let's see if time as Tywin kind of comes in the room, sees these these nef these snarling creatures on, on the little island of I'm guessing like the I'm guessing this was like the reference desk or something. Sees them snarling at him, kind of chucks his knife at one. Here's the booming roar of a musket as it blasts as Bryn blasts a chunk off of this snake's head. Or off, the, uh, let's say off, off of like his body, kind of blows away a bunch of large scales off the snake's body. And it comes just bursting across the, the water towards him as Damien is kind of skittering his way down this narrow, treacherous pass of, of damp and, and slippery cobblestones. And Tywin prepares his sword to, uh, to swing down on this approaching creature. Let's see how that works out for him. Okay, it's, it's gone, it's certainly gone better than his uh, uh, th than his throwing knife. So the creature has only rolled a six, becomes an eight. Tywin has rolled a 16, becomes a 20, becomes 25 points of damage, which becomes an instantly dead snake. So yes, the snake comes ripping across the table, leaps out of the water, and is immediately beheaded by Tywin, the man of the hour, the hero we need. And then this second snake is going to move his eight inches and unfortunately for Tywin that eight inch move does just get him in range uh like just barely like literally just by making it to that stony gap which I'm going to call engagement technically they have to be base to base but I'm going to call that engagement range so unfortunately for Tywin that's going to be another fight with another snake you know as he buries as the snake kind of lurches out of the the, the water her mouth spread open wide to, to deliver a bite. Tywin just jabs his sword down, impaling the first snake to the stonework, only to see a second one, the ripples of a second one tearing towards him. He frantically tr struggles to pull his slipper, his sword out of the slippery body of the snake and as, the, as he sees more fangs glistening out of the water. And let's see how this goes for him. Okay, it hasn't gone as good as the first time. Uh, Tywin has only rolled... Uh, a five with his plus four will get him to a nine, uh, which will only cause one point of damage to the snake, leaving him on nine health. But he does win the fight, crucially. So he doesn't take any damage. Uh, and yes, I do believe we are going to force the snake back. Uh, and we're going to have to mark up his wounds. If you give me just a moment. Mark him up. He's, he only took one damage, so he's down to nine from his starting 10. But that is going to bring us to the end of the creature phase. Not so bad. Our, our main man, Tywin, really doing his, his job as a leader and keeping his team safe. Good on you, man. 
so moving on, we are now going to have the companion phase where we are just going to have Thaddeus. Uh, well, let's start off with our doggo who is just going to move a total of 10 and a half inches because they have a movement of, oh, sorry, no, only nine inches because they've only got a six inch move. He's just going to come up with Damien. He and Damien, our doggo and Damien are going to be bestest buds and stick together. Uh, Thaddeus is probably just going to hang around with Tywin. That's, that's usually my play with Thaddeus when I don't know what else to do with him is just have him hang around Tywin because they're best bros. Uh, Archibald here is going to move his total of nine inches to about here. Keeping up behind Damien, also just going where he thinks he can do the most good because I'm not wasting his spells on a single wounded snake. Uh, as for Lady Gwyneth, she's actually kind of the only person I trust to, to get this done. Uh, so she's going to move two inches and then another two and a half for her first action, which gets her right about there. Because after the first two inches of movement, her movement cuts down by half. Fortunately for her, the, the next, um, let's see, three and a half inches goes down to one and a quarter, or sorry, no, one point one and three quarter inches, which is still enough to kind of get her onto the island. So we've got her on the island there, which is exactly why I sent her. She's got high enough movement and low enough encumberment that she's going to be able to make it to uh, over there with no issues at all. But with all that being said, that does bring us to the bottom of turn one. So it's time for the deck of scary things. Our first result is a red two. Okay, so we haven't drawn one of the uh, one of the um, generic uh, results yet, so I don't have to curse the comment section just yet. So red two, what does that give us? With a deep rumble, the stairway between the two levels of the tower collapses. Any figure currently on the stairs suffers a plus four attack. To move between the levels, it is now necessary for a figure to spend an action and succeed a climb roll target number 10. Son of a bitch. Literally the first turn of the game, and the stairway freaking collapses. Uh, why does this game hate me? But anyways, that does bring us to the bottom of the turn, and I will see you at the start of the next one. And here we are at the start of turn two. Uh, everything looking more or less how I want it to. Uh, we're going to start off the ranger phase, group activating with Tywin, Thaddeus, and Bryn, as they're the only ones who stuck around him to be group activated. And we're actually going to start off with Bryn taking his first action. He's going to dial up another shot at, at a snake, the first one already being dead. So that second snake came leaping out at Tywin, who, didn't, who did not manage to get his sword free in time and instead just kicked the snake back into the water. You know, uh, leaving one of its ha fangs hanging by a thread with the force of his kick, doing a little bit of damage, as Bryn here fr has frantically slammed another round home in into his musket. He, he, as the snake kind of slithers around, coming in for a second attack, Bryn levels his, his, his trusty weapon, hoping to finish the second beast off with his shoot of plus two against the creature's fight of plus two. No, unfortunately, the second, uh, the the second shot, we, you know, he goes to pull the trigger and there's just a soft click as the damp of the room seems to have compromised the powder he put into into in the powder pan. So the uh, the musket has failed to fire and unfortunately he is going to have to begin the process of unloading and reloading, which is going to be his whole second action. Uh, in the meantime, Thaddeus is now going to take his first action, getting into contact with the snake, not worrying about the water because he can fly. And Tywin is going to take his first action, kind of t stepping to the edge of, of the land. Ooh, we're just going to kind of put him up here. Uh, and we're going to have to guesstimate that, guys. I, I do apologize, but the ground there, a little unstable for that heavy metal model from Metal King Studios, if you guys are interested in getting one for yourself. Uh, shameless plug, hopefully <laughs> trying to send a little business to the guys who have who've provided me with such amazing minis. Uh, but Tywin's second action is going to be to fight the snake with the plus one that Thaddeus is give him, giving him. So as the, the click sounds kind of the most, oddly enough, the most deafening sound that that musket can make is the click of a misfire. Tywin hears it and just kind of groans, ah, oh, this damn technology that Bryn keeps going on about. 
So Tywin finally managed to burst his, his sword out of the skull of the first snake, steps forward as that, as the snake rounds on him, Thaddeus, as the snake is about to kind of leap forward and, and tear into, into Tywin's leg as he's getting the sword out, Thaddeus comes swooping in, kind of distracting the snake as Tywin finally gets the sword out, goes in for, for a, a swing with this time a plus five to his attack, thanks to the gang up bonus. And it works out. Thaddeus' help gets Tywin up to a pl to a 19 to the creature's total of like four. Uh, and so the sec so as this second snake is is kind of whirling about to deal with Thaddeus, he instead catches a sword in through his throat with a lightning fast thrust from from Tywin, ending this creature's existence before it can cause too much trouble. We do love a hero. And then uh, with Thaddeus suddenly finding himself with no enemies to deal with, he's just gonna kind of come chill out over here, get away from the, the from this smelly, stinking water because I can't imagine having a bunch of snakes moving around in it has helped the odor at all. But with that being said, we come to the creature phase only to find that there are no creatures for us to deal with. So that's kind of a bonus. And then we move on to the companion phase where we are actually gonna have Gwyneth just move like so. Uh, uh, call me a chicken heart, but I really don't want her to even have to try and make any swim checks. So we're just going to move her to the other side of the island, and then we'll cross the second expanse of water in the next turn. In the meantime, Damien is going to move up his first six inches to the table edge. We're going to do the same with our doggo, who I have not named because he's not going to be a permanent addition, addition and I don't want to get attached. Archibald doing much the same with his movement. And uh, that's kind of all she wrote. That, a very quick second turn, but an uneventful one, which is exactly what, what, what I like to see. But we have gotten to the end of the companion phase, which unfortunately means it's time for the deck of scary things. So we flip it over and red three. I promise I shuffled these guys. I swear to God I did. But looking over at the red three, two skeletons appear adjacent to the staircase on the level that contains the most heroes, which obviously is going to be the bottom. Roll randomly in the case of a tie. We don't have to roll for it because literally all of our heroes are on the bottom floor. So I will go fish out some skeleton minis and put them on uh, on this level. All in all, could be worse. Could be worse. Uh, it doesn't really say where on the floor to put them though. So what I'm actually going to do before we cut cut the turn, I'm actually going to roll to randomize a little bit. Uh, uh, we're going to randomize either the cone uh, on. Odds, they come up by the stairs. Evens, they come lurching out of this corner over there. Odds, okay, so they're going to be coming out by the stairwell because uh, we have rolled a one. Uh, so the skeletons are going to come out over here, and I will see you guys, and we'll get those placed, and I will see you guys at the start of the next turn. Here we are at the start of turn three, and we are moving on to the ranger phase. To begin with, we've got our pair of skeletons lurching out of the of the water ambushing our, our friends as they uh, as they come up to the just freshly collapsed stairway, kind of groaning with their misfortune, only to see a pair of armed sentient skeletons. Uh, apparently these guys have decided they, they want to go for a round two. Uh, but we're going into the companion phase, or into the ranger phase, where we're going to activate with Bryn and Tywin. Unfortunately, no one else really can activate. And uh, we're, all that Tywin can do, he's used up his... his uh, uh, is a shooting attack, and he's not in range to use it even if he hadn't. And his ten and a half inches, fortunately, between his, for his double move, is going to get him all the way up over to Archibald. And uh, I think we're going to do the same for, for Bryn. As much as a part of me wants to unload his musket at the, at the skeletons, I just can't keep him here by himself. That sounds like a recipe for getting him killed. So he's just gonna take a, also a double move up to join with Tywin. Uh, and that's gonna be the end of the of the ranger phase. No one else was close enough to group activate. So now we go to the creature phase where we are going to have the first skeleton, the nearest skeleton, move in on Damien. Uh, the skeleton is a fight plus one to Damien's fight plus three. So let's see if Damien can fend it off as he is approaching the, the still kind of 
uh, dust swirling wreckage that used to be a staircase where the kind of the roof is caved in a little bit. He looks over, sees this skeleton approaching, uh, and just barely gets his shield up to address the attack, uh, keeping his sword at the ready. He brings it chopping down on the approaching adversary, and... Okay, Damien has rolled a... Oh, sorry, I keep forgetting that this lens keeps uh, needs to stay a little farther back. So Damien has rolled a 19, where the creature has rolled a natural 1. So as this, cre as this skeleton comes lurching out of, out, of the, out of the murky depths of this very rancid water. Damien, it, being the canny warrior he is, is not caught too by surprise. He whips up his shield, his sword's still in his hand. He never puts it away while, while amongst the enemy. And as the, the skeleton lurches forward, hand outstretched with a rusty weapon looking to impale him, Damien bats the weapon to the side and brings his sword swiftly down, bashing open the skull of the skeleton, ending his miserable existence on this mortal coil. But only as, as the bone dust clears away from his sword does he realize there is a, there is a second creature. Another skeleton lur, lur, lurching, sorry, don't know why I choked on that word, but lurching forward towards him, bringing a hefty blow from his mace down to face Damien. Oh, and unfortunately this one has not gone as well. The skeleton rolling a 15 while Damien has only managed an 11. Uh, and with his armor, Damien's only got a 12, so he's going to take 3 points of damage going down to 7 health. Not great, not great. Uh, so uh, Damien will be, eh, will be uh, uh, taking a bit of damage there, but that does bring us to the end of the creature phase and over to the companion phase, where we're going to start with Gwyneth, who is going to have her initial 7-inch movement goes down to 3.5 inches, which is actually enough to get her over here, and then her second action will take her over to the... Uh, to the point of interest, and we're going to go ahead and make that a free action to interact with the point of interest. So let's find out what point of interest A has to say to us. The only bookcase still standing on this level sits on a little island. Make a navigation roll, target number 8. If successful, see note 269. Okay, so she has to make a navigation roll. Uh, she has no bonuses to this, so... Let's just see if she can crank an 8 or better. She cranks exactly an 8. All right. So, yes, Gwyneth has successfully completed her navigation roll to see what is on that, uh, what is in this bookshelf. Uh, so we're going to have to go see note 269. Uh, I'm going to have to go take a look at that at the end of the turn, and I'll tell you guys what it says at the start of the next one. Uh, as for the rest of the companion phase, Thaddeus is going to do what he does best. He, see, he sees that as the, uh, the mace of the second skeleton comes bashing down on Damien's shoulder, you know, he's too busy kicking the remains of the first skeleton back into the water, doesn't quite see the second one in time, takes a, a hit to his shoulder, but Thaddeus sees this, and he's not going to let his buddy face this threat alone, so he spends his two actions coming in to get in base contact with that, with that skeleton. He doesn't, friends don't let friends fight alone. With that being said, Damien is gonna engage this enemy again, now having a fight plus four against a fight plus one. So let's see if he can't do a little bit better with the gang up bonus. And he does, the skeleton rolls a 12 and Damien rolls a 16, becomes a 20, becomes 25 damage with the crit bonus. Uh, which, just a quick reminder, if your total fight score reaches 20 or better, you gain an additional 5 damage. That's what the crit bonus is here in this game. So the, the, the skeleton just explodes uh, with, you know, as Thaddeus, the goodest crow, whoever did live, comes and starts pecking at it and, and, and clawing at it, calling in, in its ear, causing a little bit of an echo in its own skull. The skeleton starts to stagger back as Damien shrugs off the blow and, and shield, I like to think shield bashes this skeleton into the low wall so separating his walkway from the water. It just shield bashes it down to the ground, bursting open its skull like the first and allowing the bones to, to skitter apart down into the water, never to be reformed. But with that, Damien does still have an action remaining, so he is just going to move up to the base of the stairs. I don't like the idea of him going up there alone 
we're just going to keep him there. Doggo, again, I, I don't, this is a weird gamey thing where I, the stairway is collapsed, so I'm not real sure how the dog is climbing the stairs that are now collapsed. But we're going to have uh, Archibald kind of come over here, er, clear on the way, and hopefully in the next turn, Tywin does actually have some rope in his inventory, so hopefully he can just throw up rope. And I'm going to use that as, as a way that we're getting people up the stairs. Because, uh, I mean, I have that rope in the inventory for a reason. And it finally became relevant. So uh, the rules there is that it gives you a plus five to your climb checks. So it won't automatically get them to the next level, but it'll at least help. But with all that being said, we've gotten to the end of turn three. A little more dramatic than turn two. But that's what we like to see. I'm going to have to look up the note that we found over here. But first, the deck of scary things. A red five. Okay, let's see what red five has for us. Red five standing by. So select a random hero on the table. That figure sees a glowing rune. That figure must make either a perception, target 14, or read runes, target 10 roll. If successful, it recognizes the rune as a trap and avoids it. If not, the figure suffers an immediate plus three magic attack as do any other figures within two inches of it. If the trap is avoided, gain four XP. So we need to roll for which of our companions are gonna take the hit. Uh, we're, we've got seven companions at this point, so we're gonna roll a D8 and just re-roll any eight results. Three, so one, two, three. Oh no, the doggo is the one to take it. He doesn't have bonuses to any of this. So hopefully he can make a read runes roll of 10 or better. He, no, he cranks it with a natural 20. The doggo is super literate. This dog literally lives in a content with a library. The, the library was his favorite room. He hung out here every day. He ate many a book and has ingested the means by, of reading runes. The smartest boy you've ever seen. Whoever said dogs were dumb. Only jerks say stuff like that, so no trap goes off, and we get a bonus of 4 XP from that. I love this game so damn much. Uh, but with that being said, that brings us to the bottom of turn 3, and I will see you guys at the start of the next turn. Here we are at the start of turn 4, guys, and we are just looking about as this dog is successfully kind of looking down at a glowing rune trap and somehow communicating to the rest of the team, probably through Lassie-style barks, hey, guys, that rune, don't touch it, it's scary. Uh, but we ha I did look at the note for, that, for what Gwyneth found over here in, in the corner, and it says that she found a rare and highly sought after book on navigation, hence why she had to make a navigation roll. And as it turns out, the way this item works is you can immediately give it to anyone in the party, and whoever gets it gains a permanent plus two to navigation rolls for as long as they're holding the book. Now, at the end of this mission, we can return it to our superiors in, in the Ranger Corps, but I'm probably not going to, because doing so just gives you plus 10 experience points, but a permanent plus two to a skill seems super worth holding on to to me. Maybe maybe that's just me. So we're going to give that to our, our tracker, Bryn. So he actually doesn't have any levels in navigation, which I found weird. I had to check the book to make sure I had that right. But yeah, sure enough, no, no levels in uh, navigation. But now he's got two plus two in navigation. That uses up one of his two empty uh, inventory slots. Also, real quick, at, while I was looking through our various inventory and things, I had to double check Tywin. He's actually a fight of plus five. I, I said earlier he was a fight of plus four. It hasn't made a difference thus far. He... Uh, he crushed all of his attacks anyway. Literally, all it meant is that for that second snake, he would have done two damage instead of uh, instead of one. It wouldn't. It would not have made a difference. Uh, so that's fine. But he also, I forgot to mention, I forgot to remember that earlier he found himself a shield of brightness, which means that uh, when that a total of five times he can choose when he's t attacked by a creature to gain plus five to his fight roll as the shield basically lets out a burst of light. Uh, for any of you who play D&D, &D, he basically has five charges of warding flare, which is a cleric thing for, those of you, for the uninitiated. But anyways, enough rambling about corrections I need to make mid-game. 
We're starting off turn four, and we're and we're gonna go with Tywin and Bryn. Now Tywin is gonna move up. Bryn is then gonna move up, and then Tywin's second action is gonna be to place his rope. At, uh, on the collapsed stairwell and attempt to climb. Now the rope is going to give him a plus five to this. So it's a target number 10 and I don't believe he has any levels in climb. So we're just going to roll this real quick. And he cranks a 17. So he handily makes it with a total of like 22. So that is going to make Tywin the first hero to make it to the second level leading from the front as is only good and proper. And Bryn is going to do much the same thing, also ma making a climb roll of pl with a plus five. So needing a six or better, or a five or better. And he cranks a 13, didn't even need the rope. Apparently, this incredibly slippery collapsed stairwell, it collapsed in ex exactly the right way to make like perfect handholds like out of Assassin's Creed or something. Where So these guys are just walking up to the wreckage and just like, oh wow, there's a perfectly highlighted path right up the stairs. <laughs> Somehow the, the, the exact right ledges are painted bright yellow. This is the easiest climb they've ever seen in their lives. So there goes uh, Bryn up to join his buddy Tywin. Uh, but with that, uh, we can group activate with one more person. Uh, let's do it with Archibald. His first action is going to be to make the same move with a plus five from the rope. And he rolls a 15. Seriously, guys, <laughs> somehow we've entered Assassin's Creed where you just walk up to a wall holding R2 and your character just immediately runs up the wall. So, yeah, Archibald appearing out here with his first action. And finding a pair of blood bats kind of sitting on, uh, uh, kind of biting away at some corpses littering around this dank, ruined table. If we thought the basement smelled bad, I'm betting up here smells even worse with corpses and damp wood and all kinds of wreckage from a collapsed ceiling. Uh, so we're actually going to go ahead, oh, do I really want to do, yeah, we're going to go ahead and have him shoot off his fireball spell, because it's the only thing he has that can target both of these creatures, because they're not undead, he does have a third spell that gives him like an AoE attack against undead, but bats do not count, so he's just going to ch chuck out his fireball and put it just like right here where these where the chair is and it's going to hit both of those creatures and nothing else which is going to give him a plus three shooting attack against the bats in their fight of plus one so he's going to be fight plus three let's do the bat on the left uh oh no this first roll is a natural one so that's not going well uh and then the other bat takes an 11 becomes a 14 uh, which is, uh, 13 or more is enough to kill a bat, because they have an armor of 12, with but only one hit point. Uh, so the bat on the right gets absolutely incinerated, so, uh, as, you know, Tywin ch chucks his, his looped rope up there and manages to snag a hold on, at, at the top of the stairs, climbs up there, er, mightily pulling himself up with, with the incredibly helpful highlighted handholds of this, uh, apparently Ubisoft-designed <laughs> ruined convent, uh, followed swiftly by Bryn getting up there and the two of them turning and helping to, to pull up their faithful friend Archibald, who, who is the first to actually notice the enemies in the room. These two meatheads are too busy trying to get, be, be heroic and, and uh, prove that they remember their leadership courses. Uh, that Archibald here is the first one to notice, hey guys, there's like baddies up here and just blasts as, he, as he's being pulled up. He instead swats away Tywin's hand and produces his torch, which sends a fireball bursting board. The first bat gets out of the way easily. The second one just eyes widen as his friend flies to the side and he is instantly incinerated, never to be seen again. Uh, but that does bring us to the end of the ranger phase and then it's going to be on to the uh, creature phase. I don't know why I blinked on that. I've done this enough times. But uh, for the creature phase, unfortunately Archibald is now the closest companion, as much as I wish it weren't so. So the bat is easily going to make it to him, but Tywin is obviously, obviously, going to pile in. So the bat is going to ha has a natural fight of plus one. Archibald is going to have a fight of plus one thanks to Tywin helping him. So as uh, the, the flames flicker away and, and the light dims back down to its natural gloomy hue of the, you know, 
barely existing light may somehow piercing through faintly through the roof of the convent. Uh, Tywin sees the, the fluttering wings of the bat closing and leaps forward to try and shield his friend, but the bat um, lunges toward er, its claws towards our, our faithful magician. And, uh, oh. Well, okay, so it's not, it, technically the bat has won the fight, but it could be worse. It rolled an 8, becomes a 9. Archibald has a base armor of 10, like everyone. So the bat's claws lurch forward, but as, as Tywin shield checks it, the claws just kind of barely grasp at, at uh, Archibald's cl clothing as the bat kind of flitters around, letting out that annoying screeching sound and, uh, and just kind of fluttering about uh, impotently. Moving on to the companion phase now, we are going to have uh, Gwyneth do much as she did in the previous turn, where she's just going to use her total movement to get back where she was. So she's going to be stuck traversing all this water for a good long while. Let me go ahead and get that investigation marker out. Uh, but yeah, so she's going to be stuck on that island for a bit, because uh, next turn she's going to have to cross, and then turn after that she'll make it to the cross to the passageway uh it's unfortunate but it is what it is uh so now that we've gotten our tracker and an old magician up th this incredibly handy uh collapsed stairwell that basically just collapsed into another stairwell uh we're gonna have doggo make his move as damien tries to help the sh dog's shaky legs to to kind of pull an air bud and just leap up the, the this uh, incredibly convenient stairwell so uh, climbing of plus five because of the rope hanging there. And yes, he cranks us in. Wait, is this even a stairwell or is this just like a mild bump? Because the dog literally just walks up, sniffs real quick, leaps up there like it's nothing. And he's just going to kind of come out like this with the rest of his move. Because he only uses up half of his movement to do that, moves another three inches, and then can move another three inches. So we're just going to have him end up kind of like there next to that bench, getting more of a presence in the room. Uh, Thaddeus, we're not even gonna make Thaddeus roll because he can fly, he's a crow, and, and he's just awesome. He's too good for that rolling stuff. And he's just gonna kind of come over here and end it also in combat with the, uh, blood bat. Because he's the only one who gets to fly around here, alright? That bat is intruding on his thing, he's not okay with it, and it, it, this time, it's personal. So, uh, Tywin is going to be starting off with a real strong uh, advantage in, in the next combat. And now we're going to finish up with Damien. I'm almost hesitant to have him go up there because I don't really want to leave Gwyneth all by herself. Uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to leave him here and just uh, in case Gwyneth ends up needing him. I, I'm, I'm not leaving her all alone. She may have abandoned us from time to time, but we're not going to return the favor. That's, that's not how heroes behave. But yeah, that brings us to the end of the companion phase with uh, Damien basically just kind of passing his turn. And so that brings us to the deck of scary things where we've drawn a red six. Guys, I swear I shuffled this deck. I don't know how this is happening. <laughs> red six. A pair of blood bats come flapping in from a hole in the ceiling on the second floor, place two blood bats on the desk. So literally the blood bats we just killed. Or sorry, no, we actually only killed one of them. So... One lands on the desk, and then, uh, I, fortunately, I did have another one over here, because I basically just keep my Hormagons handy whenever I play this game now. And so now we have two more Blood Bats hanging out on the table. A uh, joy of joys. <laughs> and so uh, that's... All, but all in all, as far as these uh, Shadow Deep cards go, could be worse. Could be worse. Although we haven't, we still have not drawn any of the of the uh of the actual shadow deep cards so with that we are now reaching the end of the turn game the state of the board has already been updated but i will see you guys at the start of the next one okay heading right into the next turn turn five we're gonna start off with tywin group activating uh who are we gonna have him group activate with i think we're gonna have him group activate with Bryn and Archibald as much as I would love to group activate with Thaddeus so Tywin is actually going to have a pretty massive advantage with the uh with the uh blood bat he's in combat with because he's he's a fight plus five naturally if you'll remember my correction from a couple of turns ago and 
He's got two companions in combat with the same enemy as him, so he's gonna be a total of plus seven right now. Without even that's even without activating his like frenzied attack bonus. So he, which I'm not gonna use now. Um, so yeah, plus fight plus seven to fight plus one. Uh, d didn't really need it, even if he had only, even if he'd been dice even, this, this would be a victory for him. Uh, so yeah, he's rolled a 17, becomes a 24, becomes a 29, which oddly enough, this, this I know this will be co completely shock you guys, is in fact enough to kill a blood bat. Weird, right? Uh, so for his, uh, so for... Damien, or not Damien, sorry, Bryn's first action, what we're going to do is dial up a shot at the blood bat on the left here, or the one closest to our doggo friend, because no one gets to threaten our doggo friend. And he's going to, and so as Bryn has kind of turned around and helped the doggo up onto the, up onto this level as it comes bounding away, he looks down and hears the skittering of more bats com coming down into the chamber and levels his, his freshly loaded musket, hoping this time the powder stays true and fills the room with, with a billow of smoke and, and the roaring of artificial thunder as he takes a shot at this nearest creature that dares to menace his friends. Shoot plus two against a fight of plus one. God damn it. No, the powder misfires again and Bryn must begin reloading all over again. That's going to be his second action. Uh, Archibald is going to take his first action by firing a magic bolt at the, uh, again, we're gonna go with the, uh, and actually we're gonna go against the blood bat on the right this time, as the smoke from the musket has obscured the, the bat on the left, uh, Ar Archie uh, seeing Tywin having blasted the, the fell bat apart, because the fell bat was coming in for another, uh, for another bite at Archie, only to get sliced in half by, by, a, by almost a casual, casual swing from Ty when not even taking it seriously just kind of uh, please I kill snakes I'm amazing I I I bash apart skeletons <laughs> I think I'm worried about a bat and single-handedly just blast the bat apart and so Archibald not one to be outdone by this young whippersnapper levels his, his torch and it's probably the only source of real light in here and blasts out a bolt of mystic energy at, at this horrible beady-eyed creature. It's going to have a shooting attack of plus five against the, the bat's fight of plus one. Okay, and it works out for us because uh, Archibald has rolled himself off a 15, becomes a 20, becomes a 25 points of damage against the bat's eight, becomes a nine. So, yeah, it turns out, again, a bolt of pure eldritch energy is, is tougher than a, than a blood bat. Go figure, guys. Uh, and so, yeah, that's everyone's first actions done. Uh, Bryn's second action is just going to be to reload his useless musket. He had a couple of games of being somewhat useful and has gone back to being completely useless. Tywin's going to use his second action to move seven inches into base contact with the fly, uh, or sorry, not the fly, with the blood bat, and uh, Archibald, we're gonna just have him take this moment to move six inches, if we can measure that out real quick, six inches towards the nearest investigation marker, not quite gonna be enough to get him there, gets him to about there, so that's where he ends up, things looking pretty good for us, but as now, of course, the creature phase. There's only one creature left, and it has the misfortune of being in contact with Tywin, who seems to have kind of gone beast mode in, the, in this game. He's, he's rolling hot fire. His stats are hot, his sword has tasted blood, he is ready to kill. You know, after uh, splashing apart that, that, uh, that first bat, he does not appreciate the loud, no the, the tinnitus Bryn is slowly giving him in, in, his, in his left ear, because Bryn always seems to be firing over Tywin's left shoulder. I'm not real sure why that is, it's just kind of how, how it works out. So Tywin kind of frustratingly shrugging off the tinnitus in his ear, seeing a magic bolt fly forward to burst apart another bat, surges forward, not uh, eager to, to find some semblance of safety for his team, uh, thinking that this uh, upper floor could potentially be a good stronghold fallback position if the worst should happen. So he wants to clear it out and make it as safe as he possibly can. So he's going to come in there charging forward, a uh, yell at, on his lips, um, swing down his sword uh, at, at the at the rapidly approaching bat that seeks to strike at him from above. 
Uh, and Tywin rules a 15, becomes a 20, becomes a 25. The bat rules a 10, becomes an 11. So yeah, super dead bat. Uh, Tywin just thrusts his blade forward and the point just seems to burst right through the beady-eyed face of that bat and he flicks it with the, de with the limp body flopping to the floor with, with, a kind, of, with kind of a thwack on, on the stonework of this library. Uh, and yeah, that brings us to the end of that creature phase. Didn't go so well for the creatures. Uh, companion phase... Once again, call me a chicken heart if you will. I am not willing to risk Gwyneth taking a swim check, so she's just going to come over here to the edge, and next turn she's going to finally be able to make it across to the actual crossing point, and Damien is still just hanging out, waiting on her, whistling Dixie. Uh, but that brings us to the end of a, ra of a rather eventful turn five, and it's time for the deck of scary things again. Are we finally going to get some of those Shadow Deep cards? We do with the two of clubs, and again, how is it the lowest one? <laughs> I shoveled this deck. I was hoping for a little more randomness, guys. So we've got clubs two. A vulture appears at the center of one randomly determined table edge. It follows the standard rules for an evil creature. So a vulture appears. So apparently up above this uh, up above th this uh library there were a couple bats hanging out with a vulture just eating like some random hero who died on top of the convent because this is apparently a dark souls game uh, this is like uh, you know what this is that castle right in the early stages of elden ring where apparently there's just random dead bodies hanging out on ledges but yeah so we'll have to randomize a table edge uh We'll start with this one, one, two, three, and four. We'll use a D4 real quick. Three, so three, there's gonna be a vulture appearing through a gap in the ceiling right over there on that side of the room. If I can put that, that uh, desk back up against the wall. Okay, so that is gonna be the state of the game when we come back in the next turn, and I will see you there in just a second. And here we are at the start of turn six with the very uh, from software looking vulture coming in through the ceiling. Uh, I've actually looked at the stats for this guy. As much as I'm using a mini that looks very imposing, which let me just see if I can't get a better angle on that. Let me show off some of my paintwork as amateurish as it is. There we go, fellas. Uh, this giant weapon riddled crow that uh, I actually got from a Kickstarter campaign called, uh, I believe it was, let's see, um, Tainted Grail, The Fall of Avalon was the name of the Kickstarter. It was actually, which is actually a pretty fun game that I, that I backed. The minis that I got from it were amazing. They were sculpted exceptionally well. But anyways, moving right along, we are starting off in the ranger phase. Tywin is not close enough to anyone to group activate. So, uh, what do we want to do here? I think I'm just going to have him move forward and uh, activate this point of interest, which should be point of interest B. So let's activate that and see what it has to say. The body of a middle-aged woman lies on the floor behind the desk, an ink-stained quill still clutched in one hand. On the desk is a half-complete scroll written in some ancient language. Make a read runes roll target number 8. If the result is 8 or more, see note 502. If the result is 12 or more, see note 846. Okay, so pardon me, we're going to have to take a bit of a trip here because I have to go take a look at Tywin's stats. Sorry, we're doing this live, fellas. Uh, Tywin has a read runes of plus three. So Tywin will be making a read runes roll here. Uh, I'm almost tempted to just pop his focus ability. <sighs> Do I want to? Nah. So naturally, he rolls a one. Uh, we're going to pop a Hand of Fate reroll there, because I really want to know what's in the scroll. Okay, so we've got a six with a plus three, becomes a nine. So we do make the lower threshold, but we don't we don't get to see, see the higher threshold. So that's going to limit a little bit of what we're able to see. And uh, actually, real quick, um, because we've got the middle one, it's going to be note 502. We can go check that out real quick. We can do this one again. We can do this live. 502. Okay, the hastily scrawled writing is difficult to make out, and you are unsure about many of the words. 
What it seems to say, however, is that they have removed the decanter from this place and buried it. Gain 8 XP. Okay, so the decanter was here at one point, but no longer is. That is unfortunate. So we have removed any hope of finding what we looked for in here, but we could keep looking for it. And they've buried it. Apparently they've buried the, uh, the decanter somewhere. We're going to have to figure out what that means. That could be anywhere, though. Anyway, I'll, I'll worry about that later. So that's going to be the fir his first action. His, uh, and we're probably just going to burn his second action. Well, no. Uh, Tywin's second action is just going to be to move over this way towards Archibald, trying to make himself the closest figure to the baddie. Uh, and yeah, that's going to be the end of the ranger phase. Straight on into the creature phase, Vulture is just going to move straight towards Tywin. Uh, and so Ty the creature is going to make an attack on Tywin. It's got a fight of plus zero against Tywin's fight of plus five, so I'm not loving its odds. Uh, but we'll see how this goes. Uh, wow, they roll, They did roll a tie. So I guess in in some world, the the uh, the uh, creature, uh, the the vulture, really caught Tywin by surprise. Tywin was was walking calmly over to that table, you know, examining the scroll in the in this poor dead woman's hands, and kind of turned, uh, walking over towards Archibald to see what what he's up to. And uh, now that they seem to have found a moment of calm, uh, the first real calm they've had since getting here, they. I like to think that this all thus far up to this point has been one mad dash, no breaks in between. Literally just, they they opened the gatehouse, got swarmed by zombies, were slashing their way through it. Maybe took a, a brief respite of like 30 seconds to make sure everyone was okay, band up, bandage up some wounds, pressed into the courtyard, smashed apart some skeletons. Again, uh, noticing that they were out in the open, didn't really like how many entrances there were, kind of double checked to make sure everyone was okay immediately charged into the library. This is the first breather they've had since approaching the, the, the library. And as he's march, walking over towards uh, Archie to see how, how things are going, he hears a weird, this demonic scree as a vulture comes flying in through the same holes as the bats, comes pecking down at him. But just so over this crap, he swishes his blade around, cut it, gashing through the, the creature's... Uh, uh, the creature's... Uh, gut, causing 17 points of damage. The creature is has an armor of 14 and a health of 4, so it's down to one wound. So the, the creature kind of screams and caws and, and, and backs the hell off because uh, we're actually going to have the vulture be forced back. I think that's what we're going to do there. Uh, and that brings us to the end of the creature phase. Over to the companion phase. Um... <laughs> What are we going to do? I think, yes, we're just going to have Doggo here. Do Doggo can't really interact with the uh, investigation markers very well, so he's just going to move his nine inches to join up with Tywin. Thaddeus could engage the crow, but he has died in every solo engagement he's made. Uh, so he's just going to come over here and also back up Tywin. It's going to be Tywin and his two animal companions squaring off against this giant... Uh, from software creature and uh, Archie here is just gonna ignore that entirely like, I see nothing I hear nothing Tywin's got this it's all right everything's fine everything's fine as he frantically searches a bookshelf and activates the uh, investigation marker there which if we flop back over to there is investigation marker C wow, we're actually pro proceeding alph alphabetically so may, most of the books on the shelf are obscure religious tracts that have no meaning to you. Make an ancient lore rule of target number 12. If successful, see note 337. Now, fortunately, we're having our mage do that. He's got an ancient lore of, I believe, plus three. Uh, I'll have to check that in a sec. Uh, but yeah, so we're looking for really a nine or better. Come on, buddy. And he cranks a 17, doesn't matter what his stat is. So we will be able to look at whatever that note says. So let's see. It's note 337. Then your eyes alight on a thin, dark book, which you recognize to be a rare book of lore about the Shadow Deep. 
This book counts as an item and may be given to any hero. If that hero survives the mission, the book may be returned over to its superiors and the rangers gain 15 XP or any one companion of each ranger gains one progression point. So one of my companions can get a progression or one can get, uh, or a ranger can get 15 XP, but it takes up an inventory slot until then. So Archibald just finds this incredibly rare text uh, he did not believe anyone knew anything about the Shadow Deep. It was the stuff of myth and legend. But apparently not. Apparently this convent held some secret and forbidden knowledge. He tucks the book away in the folds of his robes to, to, to decide what to do with it later. But with that being said, that's Archibald done. We're going to go ahead and take that investigation marker out of there. Uh, and then Bryn, uh, I really just feel like banging out as many of these markers as we can. So he's just going to move, he's going to double move, getting to the doorway. He's not quite going to be able to, to, uh, uh, open it this turn, maybe next turn. Uh, but with that being said, uh, we now are going to have Gwyneth make her move. Let's see. So her first move is going to be three and a half inches followed by one and three quarters, which is just enough to get her from this island over onto safe ground. So she has, by virtue of being very careful and unbelievably slow, she has managed to get all the way over to that marker and back over here without, without issue, swimming gracefully through these stinking, reeking waters. And at this point, Damien is actually gonna just go ahead and, and make his climb, because I'm pretty sure Gwyneth's gonna be okay. So Damien is gonna, gonna make his climb roll at, tar, uh, pl at a plus five, thanks to the rope. And he cranks a 13, because again, this is a Ubisoft climbing surface. It didn't even need a rope. So he uses up three inches getting there, and then he's going to have another total of six inches with his next move. He's just going to go back up Bryn, ending up about there. So that does bring us to the end of the companion phase. We go over to the deck of scary things, where we draw the red four. Flipping back over to that. Uh, red four. One of the heroes suddenly feels an inner strength. Choose one hero at random. That figure may activate in the Ranger phase and receives three actions in its next activation. Okay, someone is feeling incredibly brave, so we're going to randomly determine. Uh, again, rolling a D8 and ignoring eights. Uh, oh, sorry, that was a D4, guys. I am smart. I know what I'm doing. And we have, so naturally we roll an eight. We roll again, and this time we get a four. I don't know if you guys can quite make that, make that out. There we go. It's a four. So that's going to be one, two, three, uh, four. The doggo gets three actions in the ranger phase. All right. Go, buddy. So, uh... Yeah, I don't really know what to do with that. <laughs> my The dog is feeling a burst of inner strength. The dog is feel, living his best life. He disarmed a trap by himself. He's feeling like the best dog who ever lived. Air Bud, eat your heart out. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I don't really know what to do with that, guys. This game is the weirdest thing. But anyways, that brings us to the end of turn six. I'll see you guys at the start of the next one in just a sec. Moving into turn seven, this scenario moving along pretty nicely. I'm pretty happy with how we're doing. Uh, we're just going to start right off in the ranger phase uh, where, I mean, the it's almost wasted that the dog is the one who gets to activate on his own in the ranger phase because he's close enough to group activate. So uh, Thaddeus is going to take his first action moving in on, on the vulture uh, our super doggo, Ditto. Then Tywin's going to take his first action. And Tywin is then going to be the first one to make a second action. And it's going to be fight plus seven to the birds fight plus nothing. So, yeah. Uh, and somehow, some way, <laughs> Tywin still lost that fight. Uh, I have no answers, guys. I, I have no answers. Uh, fortunately, he's armor 12, and the bird has no has literally no bonuses to its fight roll, so Tywin will take no damage, but Tywin somehow lost a fight to a crow with a double gang up. 
So now it's going to be up to Thaddeus with his fight plus two from the double gang up. Uh, so he's going to be a fight plus two to the vulture's fight plus nothing. And Thaddeus is immediately smacked down by the, by, the crow, by the vulture and removed from play. And he rolls an 11, so once again Thaddeus is swatted to the ground thinking, oh my god, I am so done with this, guys. Uh, he has rolled an 11 on his out of action roll, so he's going to get a full recovery. But oh my god, guys, what the hell? <laughs> Because uh, the creature has rolled a natural 20. The vulture apparently got slashed across, upon, across the gut and entered his second stage boss mode. The, the, his boss health bar has appeared at the bo bottom of the screen, and we just didn't know who he was mess messing with. Uh, but our doggo is going to try to do the same. going to try to fight with now just a fight plus one against fight plus nothing. Okay, but apparently while this bird is, while this vulture was immune to mighty rangers and, and a boss level fight against our little Thaddeus, he is apparently no match to a doggo who sniffs a good treat. And, and uh, our doggo lunges forward, grabs that vulture in his mouth and just shakes it around until he's broken every bone in its stupid bird body killing it uh and it's and being the good boy he is he still has an, a move action so he's gonna move three inches this away just get, taking a more central location guys what even is this game i don't even know what i'm doing anymore <laughs> so yes uh tywin came lunging forward the, the razor sharp talons of the vulture and forcing him to lift up his shield and, blo and block the, the counterattack. Uh, Thaddeus coming in to try and wreak vengeance, only to be swatted away by the bird's massive wings. But like I said, Fido here grabbed that thing's neck in his throat and just shook until the, until it was oh so much luncheon meat for the bird for the doggo. Uh, we shall dine well on giant vulture today. Uh, that means there's actually no creature phase, so we're just gonna jump right into the companion phase. Uh, Archibald here, being the scholar and gentleman he is, is just going to move up, make a double move to the next bookshelf. Uh, because again, as Thaddeus was getting swatted back into Tywin's satchel, uh, Archibald is just kind of calmly, leisurely thumbing his way through the books. Through, through the, oh, yes, very interesting. And just completely nonchalant to the life or death struggle going on behind him. So let's see what, uh, we continue on alphabetically, what part, part, point of interest D has to say. I don't know how I just am happening to explore the, these points of interest in alphabetical order. It's weird, because you don't have to. But let's see, as you touch a book on this bookcase, you hear a strange whirring noise. See note 499. After reading that note, make either an ancient lore roll, target number 10, or read runes roll, target number 10. If successful, see note 927. So first got to flip over to 499. What does 499 say? Make a traps roll, target number 12. If you fail, a loud wail echoes around the chamber, waking up several more blood bats hiding in the rafters, where you will place three more blood bats on the desk. If you succeed, gain, a, gain 5 XP. Awesome. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we have to make a traps roll of 12 or more. Oddly enough, Archibald has no training in that. And he cranks an 11. Uh, not quite enough. So, yes, we get to place three more bats in the center of the room. Thanks a lot, buddy. <laughs> So, a trio of bats are, are alerted by the wailing alarm that apparently this book had. But now we need to make a uh, lore or read runes roll, which for uh, Archibald... Oh, actually, no, his read runes is plus five, I believe. So, yep, he needs a five or better to pass this. See what he's got. Uh, and he cranks seven, so he does in fact succeed. Uh, despite hearing the wailing noise coming out of the trap and, and hearing the flittering of more bats coming in, he's just, just taking the time to leisurely examine the book. Let's see what he finds in note 927. One moment. Crammed between several books on, on the gr on the growing of various wildflowers is a red-bound book of magic. 
The book may be given to any hero and takes up an item slot. It can only be used by a figure that can cast spells. Wow, I've really timed this well. I promise I didn't read these notes ahead of time, guys. I promise I did not read these ahead of time. This is just working out really well for me somehow. Uh, it can only be used by a figure that can cast spells. A spellcasting figure with the book may choose any two spells from the rulebook to be contained within the Book of Magic. The figure carrying the book may cast those two spells at any time using an action. Once the two spells are cast, the book is used up and discarded. Alternatively, if the book spells are not used, it may be turned over to the hero's superiors at the end of the mission. If it is turned over, the ranger may gain 10 XP or a companion may get a progression point. Okay, so uh, later on, I'm gonna have to go looking through the the rule book at, at the various other spells that he doesn't know, and he's gonna have those in his possession uh, until he decides to use them, because I'm not turning those over for 10 XP. Having access to two free spells is just too good. Uh, but yeah, so we're gonna use up that investigation marker. Uh, but we're over, we're continuing on with the companion phase, and what we're gonna do is have Damien here seeing these bats come down, you know, kind of flinching as he hears the, the, that, that alarm going off. Uh, and seeing the bats come down, he readies his sword, uh, eager to, to, spill, to spill some blood, and lurches forward to deal with, with the bats descending into the room. He, he rushes into the, into the, makes a move action into the first one, and then an attack action. So he's gonna be fight plus three against the bats fight of plus one. Damien rolls a 13, becomes a 16, against the bat's total of 5. That's going to be a dead blood bat. Yeah. Uh, making it, ooh, let's see, the, like, fourth of these blood bats we've killed. Uh, and so that's Damien's turn done. I would like to see a few more of these guys cleared out before we, before we end the turn. So we're going to have Bryn over here dial up a shot at the next blood bat. His shoot plus two against fight plus one. Because again, much like, uh, much like Damien flinched when he heard the alarm, uh, Bryn here was, was about to reach out for the door handle when Archibald triggered the alarm. Kind of whips around, sees uh, more of these bats come down, and as Damien lunges forward, running, you know, just slashing in half the first bat, uh, Bryn here levels his musket, looking to back his buddy up, and pulls the trigger, sending out another thundering crack of his gun. And naturally he rolls a two, so there's no thundering crack. The, the gun misfires again, because his gunpowder is completely ruined. And his second action is to just reload. Fun stuff. So Gwyneth here is going to use her first action to move into contact with the uh, stairs, then make a climb roll of... Oh, she actually has climb herself. She's got like a climb of plus two, I think. Or no, no look at it. She's got a climb... Hold on, let me... Let me check her stats real quick. Sorry, guys, we're going to have to do this live. Apologies, we are almost there. Lady Gwyneth um, does have a climb of plus two. So, yes, she has a climb of plus two. So she's got a total of seven right now with the rope. She just needs to roll a three or better. And she rolls a five. Uh, so she, unlike everyone else, she emerges out of that, uh, out of that water feeling a little wiped, feeling a, feeling a little tired does actually need the help of the rope, but she does get up there. So she comes up here, and uh, we'll just, and that was in fact her second action, so she's just gonna have a, like another inch of movement over like that. And that brings us to the bottom of the turn. Things could be worse. We've just got a pair of bats threatening us. We've gotten most of the uh, investigation markers. Everyone is now up on the second level. That collapsed stairwell really ain't shit. So it has no obstacle to any of it. I don't think anyone failed a, a, a climb check. No, we didn't. Literally everyone made it up first try. Uh, easiest climbing since Assassin's Creed Unity. Uh, but yeah, so now we go to the deck of scary things and we draw the four of clubs. The four of clubs. A cloying mist rises from as if from nowhere, making it hard to see more than a few yards in any direction. The maximum line of sight is reduced to eight inches for the rest of the scenario. Oh darn, if only all of my strongest fighters were right next to the only enemies on the table. I'm so disappointed. Uh, but yeah, so as, uh, I guess, uh, I, it's actually, I'm going to say it's not 
a cloying mist. It's, well, no, I guess uh, the musket has misfired every time. So as he's misfiring his, his musket yet again, he starts to see a mist coming. And initially, Brynn seems like, oh, wow, the smoke, the gun, I should ease up the gunpowder. and The smoke pa the smoke from my gunpowder is, is getting really, pretty bad. Then everyone's, oh, right, my gun isn't working. Oh, dear. This is, this is unfortunate. So, uh, mist bringing down the, the line of sight doesn't really matter. Uh, a little underwhelmed. I, I was uh, really thinking that, that card was going to be a lot scarier than it ended up being. But anyways, that brings us to the end of turn seven. We're powering through this pretty quick. We've only got three more turns left. Uh, but I will see you guys at the start of the next one. Okay, turn eight, and things are going pretty well for us so far. Um, yeah, and we're just going to activate in the ranger phase with Tywin. Not, not really much to say about it. Uh, not close enough to group activate. So he just moves into this bat, kind of was, was beginning the process of plucking the feathers off that giant annoying vulture to prepare dinner for tonight. Uh, when he he's, hears the bats coming in, uh, hears the click of, of Bryn's musket again, followed by frantic and prodigious swearing from Bryn. Turns around to see a bunch of bats flying down and just kind of rolls his eyes. What does it never end? Lurches forward to swing at the bat nearest to him with his fight plus five against fight plus one. Okay, and this time Tywin remembers how to use his sword. He's, he is not distracted by any claws this time. He just sees the two bats uh, turn their heads towards Damien as he bla blasts one apart with his sword. Uh, and as this bat turns to face Damien, it's immediately impaled by Tywin, being yeeted off the table. That makes it our fifth bat kill of the day. Uh, and that's his two turns done. Brings us to the creature phase, where the remaining bat is just going to lunge at Damien. Uh, not even noticing that Tywin has killed his, his buddy. And so Damien's going to be fight plus three against fight plus one. And uh, again, Damien, Damien's got it. Damien is not even a little bit afraid of bats. He, he has got his shield up and his sword ready. The bat comes at him. Damien gets himself a 15, becomes an 18, more than enough to deal with our sixth bat of the day. Splat and literally just holds up his shield. I like to think that Damien doesn't even use his sword. Damien just holds up his shield. The bat flies into the shield, flops to the ground, having broken its own neck with the force of its attack. Uh, and that brings us to the end of the uh, creature phase. The creatures in this scenario have just not been having a good go of it. Um, and then we're going to just have Archibald make his first action to move towards this door. Activate this investigation marker. I swear if this is somehow E, I'm going to look like I faked this whole thing. Uh, no, according to this map, that is actually point F, the only one I'm going to be doing out of out of order. So the door to this room is locked. Make either a pick lock roll target six or a strength roll target eight to open the door. This roll can be made as many times as you wish. If successful, see note, six, note 609. So yeah, we're just gonna have Archibald here attempt to pick the lock because it only requires a six and he doesn't have any bonuses to either of these. So <laughs> he rolls a natural 20. So as he's just kind of idly moving away from this book, barely even realizing that there was a fight going on, he just kind of checked a book, heard an alarm go off, and is so absorbed with reading the spells, doesn't even notice the flurry of combat as Bryn is cursing his malfunctioning weapon, and Tywin and Damien are just slashing bats apart in a flurry of blood and screeches. He's just too, and I like to think he didn't even really pick that lock. You know what that was? He, he just reached out with his hand and the lock was so rusty that a firm grip from his hand just broke the lock and the door flings open. So we're going to go ahead and take that investigation marker off the table and flip to, to note 609. As you push open the door, you hear a scream from within and see a young woman huddled behind an upturned desk. She is thin and half-starved. For the rest of the scenario, any figure in the room may spend an action and attempt a leadership role. Target number 12. This may be attempted as many times as a player wishes, and if you're ever successful, see note 992. Okay, uh, well, Archibald here has actually already used both of his actions, so we're not going to have him do that. 
Uh, and uh, I'll adjust the state of the board once we get to the end of this turn. I don't particularly feel like doing that right now. Uh, companion phase. Otherwise, we're going to have Doggo here just kind of move up here to get central. And we're going to have Gwyneth uh, just move her double action towards the door to back up Bryn. Uh, Damien's just gonna move over here, uh, again, kind of keeping central to deal with any threats that might come up the stairs. Not really much else to do. Uh, Bryn is gonna back up against the door and attempt to unlock the last investigation marker, which will be E. Uh, let's see, E. The door to this room is locked. Make a Make either a pick lock or a strength uh, to open this door. If you, you can try this as much as you want. If you're successful, look at one, note one seven two. So let's see if uh, let's see if Bryn can make a pick lock roll of six. He rolls an eighteen. Again, these locks are just not super sophisticated. He literally just just kind of turns the knob real aggressively and opens the door. So w note one seven two. Apparently, this room was once a treasury of some type, although almost everything is now missing. In the center of the room, there is a large empty plinth. Place a treasure token next to the plinth, place three blood bats around the plinth, and gain 5 XP. Uh, so I will have to adjust that at the end of the turn, which is where we're at now. So I'll, I'll have that adjusted and ready to go for the next turn. Uh, in the meantime, let's go to the deck of scary things where we've drawn the Red Ace. The Red Ace, let's see. Pick one random hero on the lower level. There are no level heroes on the lower level. That figure should make a perception roll target 12. If it fails, place a giant water snake in combat with the figure. If it succeeds, place a giant water snake anywhere within three. If there are no figures on the lower level, ignore this card. So yeah, the card is ignored, it means nothing. Uh, because we were smart enough to get the hell away from the water as quickly as we could. Um, yeah, so that brings us to the end of turn eight. Two more turns to go, and we're gonna be trying to calm down the hysterical survivor who has somehow hung on in what I'm gonna assume was like the pantry for the library? I don't know. But uh, anyways, I will see you guys at the start of the next turn. All right, and here we are at the start of turn nine. Uh, hopefully not, not gonna be too much more of note to happen here, but we're gonna go Launch right into uh, the ranger phase, where the first action is going to be Tywin uh, trying to pass a leadership check to calm this lady down. He's got a leadership of, I think, seven at this point. But we're going to pop his focus ability to just have it automatically pass. Uh, so he just automatically passes his, his leadership check to get her. And then let's see... Um... Okay, so the note said that if we if we successfully pass the leadership check, we should flip to note 992. And here we are. Okay, so the note says the young woman has an the young woman was an initiate of the Order of Saint Emilia. She knows very little of what happened. She remembers a horrible earthquake and thick clouds of ash. The nuns that survived started rushing about, but none stopped to explain anything to her. Then the creatures attacked. Monsters pouring out of every corner. She ran in here and locked the door, found a bit of food, and has been drinking rainwater ever since. She doesn't know how long she's been in here, but the young woman joins your, joins your heroes as a free companion. She has the stats of a conjurer and knows two spells, heal and strongheart. She is completely unarmed, unless another figure gives her a weapon. If the young nun survives to the end of the mission, gain 15 XP. Uh, she can continue being used as a companion after this mission, gaining progression points as normal, but the players will have to pay her recruitment points. Okay, so we have found ourselves, for the moment, in possession of a free uh, conjurer. Don't mind me, I just accidentally stepped on one of my minis and broke it. That's fun. Oh well. But, uh, <laughs> don't worry, it was just one of my skeletons, it's not the biggest deal in the world. But yeah, so uh, anyways, we found ourselves a free conjurer who will be able to activate in the companion phase, and uh, I'll, we'll see if I, if I feel like keeping her around uh, come the, the end of this mission, but regardless, it'll be worth 15 experience points. We'll hold on to her, and also just like narratively, of course we're going to try and hold on to her and, and keep her safe. We're heroes, after all. Tywin is a man of the people. 
why would he do anything less? But with that first action out of the way, his second action is going to be to move seven inches towards the fight. And I just realized I also knocked over Doggo in, in the course of adjusting the board. So here we are. Uh, yeah, so moving on to the creature phase. We're going to have this bat here, because we have a trio of, of blood bats in this armory. It's just going to move straight at Bryn. Gwyneth is, of course, going to pile in. Tywin not quite close enough to pull that off. Uh, so the bat is going to keep attacking Bryn, because again, this is another one of those situations where Bryn actually has more health than Gwyneth, and rules, you know, rules as written say that Gwyneth should actually be the one getting attacked here. I think that's a little weird considering it attacked Bryn. It came, was coming right at Bryn. It feels really weird to just suddenly say, oh, hey, but never mind, because the rules, because of weird meta rules, he must now attack Gwyneth. Uh, so this bat sees the door lurch open, sees this leather-clad figure, and immediately lets out a screech as it be as it immediately starts flapping towards the leather-clad man, who will be a fight. He's normally fight plus two, so he's now fight plus three against the bat's fight of plus one. Uh, and he rolls a 17 uh, against the bat's two, becomes a three, so his 17 becomes a 20. So as the bat leaps forward, Bryn is just completely on it. Even with the minus one damage he would take because he's using a quarter staff for his melee weapon, because we're that's what he's technically armed with. I like to think of it as just his musket being used, like he's using the butt of it to club the bat out of the air. And so he just sees this bat coming a mile away, he's just kind of yawn, bash, and, and just knocks the bat out of the air, killing one easily. Uh, but then next up is another bat. Uh, this one coming in straight for Bryn. Gwyneth is once again going to pile in. And just rinse repeat. This is another fight plus three against fight plus one. Uh, doesn't quite go Bryn's way. Uh, I mean, that's not true. He, it does. He, he rolls a four with a plus three becomes a seven. Minus one damage becomes six. Unfortunately, the black bat has an armor of 12. So we're just going to force that bat out of combat over this way. And the next bat is gonna do much the same thing. Fly forward, Gwyneth piles in, and uh, we roll again. Oh no, oh dear. This time the bat has rolled a, nat a 19, which becomes a 20. Uh, Bryn only has an armor level of 11, so he takes nine points of damage, is now down to three wounds. That's not Great. Um, oh no. So we're gonna come over to the companion phase now where our doggo is just gonna move around this way to kind of back up Gwyneth because I wanna make room for Damien to come through and actually swing on the bat in combat. Uh, so the doggo ends up over there, Damien ends up in combat, and is going to be a fight plus four against the bat's fight of plus one. Let's see if that helps him at all. Uh, it does, sort of. Uh, so Damien looks over, sees that the first bat has been clubbed out of the way by, by Bryn, but the second one has just firmly latched onto Bryn's neck, letting out a, a scream of pain as uh, as Damien comes hurtling forward, shoving past Tywin to help his buddy out, and just bursts his sword through the stomach of that bat, uh, th throwing it off his blade with contempt as he looks to make sure his buddy's okay. Uh, and over here, we're just going to measure it out real quick. So it's going to be about four inches, another five inches. So uh, Bryn's wound marker comes back over this way, but our healer just kind of ends up over this way. And that's actually going to bring... Oh, no, sorry. Bryn, Bryn and Gwyneth do still technically have their turns. So Gwyneth is going to throw her throwing knife. Sorry, we don't have a great angle of that room. Uh, so Gwyneth right here is going to throw her throwing knife at the last of the bats. She's a shoot of plus one against the bat's fight of plus one. Uh, but she rolls a two, which becomes a three. Bat rolls a three, becomes a four. The throwing knife is useless, so she's just going to back up. <laughs> she wants nothing to do with that. Uh, and then Bryn is just going to level his musket at the one bat remaining out of combat and try to fire off with his shoot of plus two against a fight of plus one. 
No, he rolls a natural one, and the, and the musket jams again. His second action is to reload. God damn it, Bryn. Why must you remain so perpetually useless? Uh, but that does bring us to the end of the companion phase with that. Oh, sorry, no, it doesn't. Uh, Archie is still here. He does still exist. So he's just going to move up behind Tywin, suddenly very worried about his friend. Having heard the shout, he finally, uh, after finding the young woman standing in, in, in that office, letting out her, her shout of alarm, he kind of snapped up, like, oh, wait, there's stuff going on. Oh, right, there's enemies around. So he kind of claps his book shut and comes rushing over to, to see what's the matter with, with Bryn. But we get to the end of the companion phase, uh, and we go to the deck of scary things, where we've drawn the cl three of clubs from the generic... Uh, card table, three of clubs. The heroes feel a strange tingling, and suddenly all of the monsters they are facing seem to gain new strength. Next turn, all evil creatures gain plus one fight. Awesome! <laughs> well, I'm glad that happened at the end of the game and not the first draw. I'm, I'm glad we're, we're doing, dealing with that going into turn 10. Uh, but yeah, all right, so we're just gonna, that brings us to the end of the turn, and, uh, I will see you guys at the start of the next one. All right, going straight into turn 10, uh, Bryn and Damien both looking a little hurt here, oh, Bryn more so, uh, we're gonna group activate with Tywin, and he's gonna activate with Damien and Bryn, who is gonna make one, Bryn, we're gonna start with Bryn, give him one last chance at redemption, see if he can't clear out this infuriating bat with his shoot of plus two against a now a fight of plus two. Um, okay, I mean, he can. Okay, yeah, so he can. He does roll a 10, becomes a 12. The bat rolls a two, becomes a four. Uh, the 12 would normally be just enough to do nothing against the bat's armor of 12, but he's got crossbow stats, so he gets plus two damage up to 14, just enough to kill the last blood bat. Blasting it apart with with the one with the only the second successful shot of the game his first shot worked deal, Dealing some considerable damage to a snake Every other shot has misfired as he's constantly trying to get non ruined gunpowder into his gun and Finally he has managed to get off another shot filling the or the treasure room with uh, uh, With smoke as he finally lets out a thunderous crack of gunfire in this very cramped space partially deafening everyone else uh, but other than that, just fine. And then Damien on his turn uh, is just going to move forward and get the treasure token next to that plinth. Uh, Britain's second action is going to be to uh, uh, to reload his gun. Tywin is going to take his actions to just kind of gain a foothold here. There's no creature phase. Our healer is going to come running forward, and she's going to use her healing spell... Because she can do that once per game. She has the having the heal spell. So let's go flip through this book to what the heal spell even does. I mean, we know it heals, but other than that. Okay, come on. Heal, heal, heal. Okay, uh, five lost health points. So Bryn was taken down to three. Goes back up to eight. So Bryn's actually not looking too bad. Having that heal spell is going to be so handy because we're going to have it once per game every game. Uh, so yeah, that's looking pretty solid. All right. Uh, so we, we get, we've we gotten through th this turn. There's no com creatures. Uh, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of okay with where all of my companions are. So that brings us to the bottom of turn... 10, where we're going to draw the last card, which is the Ace of Clubs, which we're going to flip on over. A horrifying howl echoes around the ruins, sending shivers down the spines of the heroes. Every hero must make a will roll, target 10. If it fails, it receives a maximum of one action during the next activation. That kind of doesn't matter, because I, I normally would play out a turn 11 just to see what happens, but there's no enemies on the table, and the card didn't bring any enemies onto the table, so that's just the end of the scenario. Um, there's not really a lot of point in playing it out. 
Yeah, so, but all in all, things could have been worse. Things could have been worse. Things could have gone a lot worse. Um, Damien's going to go back up to 10 points of health at the end of the game, because between scenarios, you either go up to half health or gain three health for the rest of, for all, all the scenarios in this mission. Uh, Bryn is going to gain another three, going up to 11 health. So Bryn is actually more or less fine. He's taken effectively one point of damage. Damien going down to just two points of damage. Yeah, things could be looking a lot worse here. Uh, but with all that being said, we have reached the end of the turn, end of the final turn, the end of the scenario. Things could have gone a lot worse for us. Things were going pretty solid. We just had kind of one shaky turn of combat against some bats, but all in all, not too bad. But with all that being said, we now have a clue. We've gained ourselves a healer. We have a clue that apparently the decanter was here, has been buried in the ground. And, uh, with all that being said, we're gonna have to, I'm gonna have to think pretty hard about about what I'm going to do next uh, in terms of in terms of the scenarios but uh, with all that being said I'm just going to take a couple of seconds to tally up the XP and then I will see you guys in the outro all right there we have it we have gotten another scenario of Rangers of Shadow Deep in the bag uh, things took a little bit of a turn for the rough in that last in those last couple of turns but we managed to pull it out and between our new healer and just the healing mechanics of this mission we're actually more or less okay. Damien is like two wounds off full. Uh, Bryn is literally just one. And oddly enough, after checking out our experience point progression, Tywin has not leveled up, but uh, Bryn, the tracker, did. He got his 10th progression point and gained another health point. So he's now at 12 out of 13 rather than 11 out of 12. Go figure. Um... So yeah, uh, party all in all looking pretty solid. Uh, we've con we've found another clue. We ba we more or less successfully looked at every no note that uh, every every little clue there was to find, and uh, we we have we've been told that they've buried the decanter that we're looking for somewhere. Uh, I'm still thinking about uh, about how um, how where that might be the most likely place to look next but more on that next time. Um, yeah, other than that, no real progression to point out, except, sorry, the treasure token that we found in that little armory, that little treasure room with the bats, that turned out, we rolled it up, and that was a potion of wraith walk, which I gave to Gwyneth. So she will now have uh, a potion of wraith walk that she can use. It's a one-time use, and basically just lets her, for the duration of a scenario, ignore terrain rules that she can just kind of walk across the board however she chooses um, walk through walls walk through doors uh, i'm pretty sure she can, she can just ignore like walking through like spider webs and stuff like that so pretty handy i could definitely see that being useful depending on the scenario and we found a bunch of useful items a plus a plus two navigation book for Bryn and a temporary spell book for archibald we're, we're looking pretty strong uh, I ended up putting the armor and teleport spells in, in the spell book. So uh, now all of a sudden our damage dealer has some actual utility spells because frankly we were out of damage dealing spells to give him. Uh, but with all that being said, I really enjoyed this scenario. I hope you guys enjoyed watching it. I hope you're enjoying the missions. Uh, please do, do leave a comment down below to share your thoughts. If I'm missing anything, if there's any rules I've gotten wrong, I would love your guidance. Or just let me know if you're enjoying the the campaign so far. But other than that, ob obligatory reminder to, to hit the like button, subscribe, maybe help the channel grow a little bit. Although I do already owe you a big thank you for even watching this far. Uh, but with all that being said, I can't wait to see you guys in the comments down below. I can't wait to see you on some of our other videos. But in the meantime, happy wargaming. Onward to glory!